So welcome everyone to, to the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business in London. Uh, it's an honor to have such an esteemed uh, group here. Uh, and a special welcome to all the panelists and speakers that will be here over the next two days. I think Peter and, and Lori put together a great group of academics and practitioners. Um, so it it's, will be a delight to have you here in our facility. Um, for your conference. Uh, as Fred said, I'm Glenn Sykes. I'm the managing director for the school here in Europe. I don't want to take up too much time of your morning, uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity to have a few minutes of your attention before you begin the conference. When we were first approached by Peter about partnering with them on this conference, it was very easy to say yes, not just because I started my life as an accountant, um, but our school's excellence in accounting and, re and our interest in being a forum for debate uh, exchanging ideas and networking um, was a really perfect fit to host this conference. Um, as I mentioned, we'd like to be a center for exchanging ideas and networking, uh, and like today's program. Throughout the year, we have thought leaders from our faculty, our alumni, and business executives. We've had Gary Becker here, George Schultz, former Secretary of State, Treasury, and Labor in the U.S. And in the next few months, Nobel Laureate uh, Myron Schultz will be here, and the noted behavioral economist Dick Thaler. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. Can everybody hear me nice and clearly? I hope so, because I don't know whether the first session is a gift or, or a curse, so we shall find out pretty soon. Um, thank you for the, uh, the, the great introduction. Uh, we haven't met yet, actually, but uh, the personal nature of that was touching, uh, I, I, ha I have to say, so, so well done on that one. Um, just to put some context on what I'm going to speak about for the next 40 minutes um, or so, and then we'll obviously hopefully have time for questions. Um, I'm a sell side analyst. So I sit in equity research within um, City, um, and my area is instead of being a stock analyst, I'm the accounting and valuation analyst. So my job is essentially to deal with accounting and valuation queries from investors. So it, it's useful to be clear right up front that my clients are not companies, they are institutional investors. That's point number one. Point number two is the type of research we publish um, is, is probably sits between formal academic research and educational stuff. So for example, recently we've had a huge number of, of rights issues in, in the UK, uh, and therefore we immediately published something on rights issues, looking at historical rights issues, how successful had they been, were there a good flag of future performance, etc. So we react to things as they go along, as well with basic stuff like, this is a pension number, what does it actually mean? How should you integrate that number in your valuation, uh, your valuation model? So on the sell side, clients, investors, output is, uh, is research, but as I said, a mix of educational and, and more kind of back-tested, empirical-based stuff. Uh, and obviously, it's been a pretty interesting time to be in, in research in Europe because we've had the IFRS conversion over the last, last few years. And interestingly, I've been on two or three trips to the US to speak to US investors about IFRS numbers to try and start that process. And we made a, pu we had a publication in the US in January on um, IFRS in a US environment. What would it look like, uh, as the case may be? I can tell you over the last six months, investors' minds have returned to accounting. You don't necessarily get a reward for detailed accounting knowledge when everything is going up. Okay, at least that's the perception um, for investors. When times start to get more difficult, uh, then you find investors very much more focused on accounting issues. How do analysts use the information? So practically, what do they do? So about 20% of my time is sell side analysts coming to me and going, Ken, here's a stock option number. How do I integrate that into my enterprise value model? It's non-cash. Does that mean it doesn't make any difference? What were the, when we surveyed analysts, what did they, sell side analysts, may I stress, what did they say were the most important issues for them? Um, now I'm going to be honest, this, was, this survey was done at the point of the transition. Okay, so just uh, I'll wrap up pretty quickly on this. By the way, any of our research papers, if you want, please send me an email. I'll be very happy to send them to you um, for your own personal use. 
I always have to say that uh, at the end of that. But this was a report we issued last year on IFRS versus US GAAP. And what this looked at, and this looked at 20F reconciliations. So what we were looking at here was companies, and it was 101 companies listed in Europe, which were also listed in the US. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, Peter, Laurie, thank you very much for the support in, in, in making it possible and making the arrangements for me. Certainly very easy to be here today, and I, I am delighted to be here. Um, as you've heard, I am a transaction services partner in, in KPMG. I wanted to say a little bit by way of introduction as to what that means, just so that you know, and therefore why perhaps what I have to say might bring some insight into uh, the topic I've been given, which is a practitioner's perspective on cross-border M&A. Uh, transaction services is part of the uh, things that need to be done when M&A gets done. Uh, you're probably familiar with the role of the investment banks, which typically might be called corporate finance. Well, transaction services is the name which these days we call what used to be called due diligence. In 2004, we did a piece of research that said 30% of vendors, 30% of those people selling their business, found themselves facing a 20% price chip. They got 20% less for their business than they thought they were going to get. In last year, we published a piece of research that said nearly half of corporates felt that on their last disposal they didn't realise full value. And a, nearly a quarter of private equity houses, houses felt the same about their last disposal. I want to just talk to you about a, a large cross-border deal that we were involved in. This was advising Ford Motor Company on this year's sale of the Jaguar Land Rover businesses. Now let's next let me talk a little bit about lessons learned from the recent market turmoils. The first one I would like to say, you know, I last two weeks I've been visiting our clients in Europe. And in, for every single uh, conversation, and people always like to talk about you know, what actually happened, what's happening, what lessons can we learn. I always like to start off with say, we're still in the midst of it. In the fog of war, events are still unfolding. So we need to be careful with definitely conclusion because you see a lot of write downs and these write downs are primarily on subprime mortgages and uh, uh, leveraged loans. Uh, the write downs haven't truly occurred for credit cards, auto loans, uh, CMBS and uh, the, the, the typical corp corporate credit. Uh, so these defaults will happen eventually. So a lot of the discussions we have to put the put this discussion in that context. Uh, sorry, you're talking about underlying business quality or you're talking about the quality of that specific loan? No, the assets that are used as collateral. Oh. The, uh, we don't do explicit um, uh, modeling of that, of that underlying assets because that's, that's very hard. You have to uh, actually look at what kind of asset it is and, and the cash flows. We don't do that. Yes, please. Could you say something about who was responsible for the mispricing of the subprime mortgages? Was it the credit rating agencies or was it the banks? Um, the, uh, I'm speaking as uh, just an individual and, and have to be very careful <laughs> because I work, uh, my parents, uh, it's, you, you got to be very careful with, uh, when you talk about your parents. Uh, the, um, there, there, I, I would think that there are plenty of blame to share, uh, right? Um, the, uh, I, I can quote what uh, the ex-president of Moody's Investor Service said, uh, Mr. Brian Clarkson, he said that uh, we expected uh, a, a storm and we got a tsunami. And the, the banks, you know, they are the ones actually wrote these loans, right? These guys wrote these uh, mortgages and mortgage brokers and, and, and frankly, the investors, right? right? And, and the regulators. And then I, would, I would argue that there's plenty of blame to share. Okay. Uh, based on your experience working with your kind in the last five years, right. can you give us a sense of the precision of those estimates from the, those models for the typical level two or level three uh, instruments? I mean, I, I understand that you can all have a model and you can put on estimate, but how much can you actually trust 
those estimates and how useful would that be for accounting for accountants if you want to put them on the financial statements? Right. Um, so that's a very important question, which is around validation. And uh, we actually have done uh, two rounds of validation studies. The first one is uh, using loan X prices. The second one is using LPC prices. These are two dominant players, uh, providers of loan prices information. And what we find is that actually, for the for the ones we think are liquidly traded, the match are pretty good. And we also have done exercise try to understand why we see mismatches. So. What I can see, is, by the way, the, uh, actually we, ha we do have the reports, and these reports are public available. And I actually, I should say that I have a, a list of uh, suggested re readings in my last slides, which you can take a look, and uh, provide actually a lot of statistics of the performance of the model. And the banks who have been using our tool have also done their individual validation studies. So I'm going to leave. Uh, I'm going to end my talk with some food for thought, some potential academic research topics. Certainly at Moody's KMV, we have been contemplating these issues. If any of you have interest working with, with, with us, please do let me know. Now, there are quite a bit of uh, uh, interesting research topics, as we see, uh, in this area. The first one is around the relationship between commercial banks earning qualities and stock valuation with its risk management practices, with its counting practices, how they di disclose on their, um, on their, uh, uh, on their financial uh, instruments. We actually quite have quite a bit of data uh, on these issues. Um, if any of you uh, uh, like to work on these areas, please, uh, with us, please let me know.